on Larry King now, the great Norman Lear, the TV legend on the inspiration behind some of his greatest creations. You know, there's an Archie Bunker around every corner, and as I've experienced it through the years, I've heard it from countless people. He was my uncle, he was my father, everybody related to the reality of the guy. And why his real life was maybe more dramatic than any show he created. And this asshole puts his hands on my nine-year-old shoulder and says, you're the man of the house now. Plus, 92 years old, uh, what do you do every day? I have, uh, I, I get up. <laughs> <laughs> All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now, the legendary Norman Lear is many things, writer, producer, show creator, and a television visionary. The creator of groundbreaking comedies like All in the Family, The Jeffersons, and much more, his shows included the first to star a black family, the first to talk about then taboo topics such as abortion, opposition to the Vietnam War, and the transgender issues, among others. His memoir, even this I get to experience is out now, and I, told, I told him before we started, I bought this book <laughs> two weeks ago. I bought it before I knew Norman Lee was going to come. Normally they bring their books. I'm happy to have bought it. I'm happy to have started it. And what I made a dollar seventy-five. You make a buck seventy-five. Oh, yeah. President Clinton said of this book, Norman Lee can find humor in life's darkest moments. That's no surprise. It's the reason he's been so successful throughout his more than nine decades on Earth. It's also why even this I get to experience is such a great read. Finding dark moments. One of the, Neil Simon said, all humor is based mm -hmm. on tragedy. It's just the reverse. How did you approach that? Well, I learned it when, uh, when uh, early in my life, nine years of age, my father went to prison for three years. And... Uh, my mother was selling all the furniture one night. This is the way the book begins. Oh, my father's gone. He's hauled off to prison. My mother's selling the furniture. She's about to take my sister and leave me with an uncle and an uncle and then my grandparents. And this asshole puts his hands on my nine-year-old shoulder and says, you're the man of the house now. I had that happen to me when my father died, nine years is, old. Is Someone right? said to me, you're the you're man, the man of, the of the house. That's terrible. Well, it it's, was the beginning of my understanding the foolishness of the human condition. I mean, in the saddest of uh, moments, there's something foolish going on. What did he go to prison for? He sold some fake bonds to, uh, he tried to sell some fake bonds to a major brokerage house. <laughs> How did you get into the business you got into? Were you in radio first? No, I wanted to be a press agent. I wanted, I had one uncle who used to, I was a kid of the Depression, the little before your time. Well, I was born in 1933, that was the Depression. Well, but you weren't started. old enough to experience no. it. I experienced it at my age. But I had one uncle who used to flick me a quarter when he saw me. And it was a lot. I, I just, all I wanted to be, that was my role model. An uncle who could flip a quarter to a nephew. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what a press agent was. He said he wanted to be a press agent. I wanted to be a press agent. What was your first hit? Uh, called Danny Thomas one day. Uh, got his number from his secretary and phoned Danny Thomas. Went over to his house. That's a story in itself. Sold him uh, a piece of material that he did the next night at Ciro's. And the following morning, he got a call from David Susskind, who was an agent at the time, come to New York. Jack Haley, Ford Star Review. All in the Family was a British show, right? It was a, yeah, called Till Death Us Do Part. Right. And they had, and they did all the same thing you were doing? They were doing that in Britain? Well, they did some, he, you know, they first of all did six, eight, eight shows a, a season. That was a season in Britain. A lot more civilized than uh, us. And uh, I, I don't mean to denigrate it in the least. It was hilarious. But it was all about the argumentation. It was not about stories and I got no it. heart, no soul. Why did you think it would work here? Because I knew something about life here. 
And, uh, you know, there's an Archie bunker around every corner. And as I've experienced it through the years, I've heard it from countless people. He was my uncle, he was my father, everybody related to the reality of the guy. Why do you think we liked him? Well, I loved him, so that's a start. He loved his wife, he loved his daughter. He, I think people understood intuitive. I don't remember whether we dealt with it in a specific story, but he was not a hater. He was afraid of tomorrow, afraid of progress, black family moving next door, that kind of thing. Uh, he was just afraid of losing his job of, uh, of tomorrow. Did you have a tough time selling the network on carrying it? It only took three years to sell. <laughs> <laughs> they ran an advisory at the beginning of the show, right? Yes, it did. And they also, Wall Street Journal said that it almost didn't get on the air, right? Well, it took three. I made the pilot the same script three times. But you, happily, I didn't have the same young people. I didn't have Rob Reiner and Sally Struthers the first two times. You didn't? No. So this, you talked about luck earlier. I've had the greatest luck. You have to have talent, too. Uh, you write in the book about butting heads with Carol O'Connor. You've called him murderously difficult, right? In what way? He didn't like most of what he read. Now, I was wise enough, I guess, at my age to understand that he was carrying a load. I mean, the, boom, the show made him a star and, uh, and a bigot at that. And he was an extremely intellectual guy, you know, Dublin, Dublin theater uh, kind of intellectual. And, a, and, and with one of the best hearts and wisest minds, so playing this bigot was not easy. Although he, I didn't have to talk him into it, he ached to do it. And he brought it, I put words on paper, he inhabited them. I mean, he says. But he didn't want to do certain things? He didn't like he didn't, them? He didn't, he was afraid of, he's afraid basically of being Archie Bunker. I struggle with it because it's so human and complex, but you're going to go to a break. I can see in your eyes, and we're going to talk about this afterwards. You notice this? <laughs> we'll be back with the great Norman Lear right after this, the book, Even This I Get to Experience. We're back with Norman Lear. Did you part enemies? Or if not enemies, did you have a bad ending with Carol O'Connor? No, no. Well, uh, he was un very unhappy with certain aspects of our relationship. But when he passed, and I went to the house to visit his wife, Nancy, with a lot of other people, she asked me to wait uh, after the others had left. And when we were alone, she took me into a hallway, to a room, and opened the door. She, it, was un, it was locked, and it was his study. And the desk was as empty as this one, except for a piece of paper, a letter that I had written him four years before, telling him how much I, I loved him and, 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 and how difficult, and how much I hated the time, we, we, some of the time we spent together uh, uh, fighting, but basically how much, I, how grateful I was for the world. That was the only piece of paper on his desk. Talk about television today. Are they, there's edgy shows today, aren't there? I mean, they've come a long way, haven't they? Well, well uh, dramatically, my God, there's everything in the world. Uh, because of cable? Because of cable, I guess, and no need of sponsors and their interventions. But we got shows like Modern Family. You like that? Oh, I love Modern Family. Blackish is a pretty and, good show. I haven't seen Blackish yet. There was an article in the paper this morning. I'll see it tonight. I've T voted already. Are they socially conscious today, too? Uh, I think uh, South Park is as socially conscious as <laughs> I've ever been. And uh, uh, I, I love the uh, Seth MacFarlane and his humor. Oh, what a genius. Yeah. I mean, you're wild, Norman. You were always ahead of your time, right? How do you explain that? As you look at yourself, I mean, you're, people 92 tend to be conservative. You get more liberal. Well, I don't think I was so much ahead of my time as understood my time. I mean, 
that people could live with a bigot when the, those bigots were 10 to a block? I mean, how much did, you know, bravery did it take or understanding did it take? I was, I dealt with the reality of my world. That's all I did. So the That's show all we did, excuse me, because it was this, uh, obviously, it was a giant collaboration. A lot of brilliant writers. Well, did you create the spinoff? The, the word spinoff was created by, I don't know who, the press gave us the word spinoff. What, what I always thought of was this actor is wonderful, it, it kind of a bush league that's waiting to get into the majors. That was the metaphor I used. And so Florida was a maid on, on Maud, and one could see that she owned the audience when she had a, a few good lines. So we introduced John Amos as her uh, husband, and that was the seed of, but they were in the Bush Leagues, and then he went to the majors. That was more than a Jefferson spinoff from All in the Family. Yes, right? yeah. And Good Times, and Sanford and Son. Well, Sanford and Son was an entirely different situation. Bud Yorkin and I fell in love with him in Las Vegas, and we brought him to <laughs> worried that he couldn't stay clean uh, from Red a Fox, from a language one of the greatest standpoint. comics of all time. Clown. I, oh. use, I love the word clown. Now, now, what do you make of shows online, thousands of choices, uh, television on demand? It's a whole different... Well, this is America. We overdo everything. You know, we like something that we have to have more. As I said, there were eight episodes of uh, Till Death Us Do Part. We had to do 24 here. What keeps you going? Even this I get to experience, you know. What made you write the book? Uh, I told myself I was, I was 70 maybe when I told myself I was going to write the book. And I started making notes and paying a lot of attention to what happened to me in the past. And I wrote, the, it took about six years, actually, to write the book. Why did you write about things? I mean, you wrote about your second wife, which diagnosed manic depressive, tried to commit suicide. Uh, was that cathartic? Was that difficult to write? No, it was just honest. Oh, well, it was all difficult. Everything it was difficult to write about my father. It was difficult to write about it all. But I cared to tell an honest tale, and I think Part of what we were talking about reflecting in the shows was caring to do it, tell an honest tale. How do you do family life without dealing with the problems of family life? But that's what preceded us, you know, with Beverly Hillbillies, the Petticoat Junction, Green Acres, you know, the roast is ruined and uh, the boss is coming to dinner. Did that's you like not. taking on battles? Did you like being groundbreaking? I didn't truly didn't think of it that way. No? They were little arguments. You know, on the first All in the Family, the final argument was about this line. The bunkers are coming home from church because he hated the preacher and the sermon. The kids have been in the house alone, and they start to go upstairs to make love in the house alone. The bunkers come in, the kids come running down, and he says, 11.10 of a Sunday morning that line had to come out. Until 20 minutes of the, before it was going on in New York, they had cut that line, it was out of the show. And I said, if it's out of the show, I won't be back. Now I realize as I say that, it sounds like, oh boy, what a big deal that was. But I had understood that my script could live without that line, and the show would be great without that line, it didn't need the line. But if I lost that silly argument, I would lose every silly argument that followed, and there'd be a lot of them. So it was, it was a tiny battle. It, yeah, it was kind of a mild line, though. I think of it as, <laughs> well, certainly today it's a mild line. <laughs> Next, more of my conversation with the great Norman Lear. Don't go away. The book is Even This I Get to Experience. I love that title. Uh, Norman Lear, one of the great, great figures in the history of American uh, television. What is, life, what is life like for you now? 92 years old, I, what do you do every day? I have, uh, I, I get up. <laughs> <laughs> That's I a big it. start. I start every day getting up. <laughs> and uh, I've got six kids. 
I have my youngest are 19, my oldest is, she'll hate me for saying this, 68. My, my twins are uh, sophomores at college. They live in the East, so I go back and forth. And, uh, and I have a next. I want to do a next. You do? Yeah, uh, the, those two words, over and next. <laughs> we don't understand always how important they are. When something is over, it's over. And on to next. How's your health? I think it's pretty good. I expect when this is concluded, I'm going to get up and walk out. <laughs> Did you ever think of retiring? I never for a minute thought of retiring. Never for a minute. I have to reinvent myself because this is a younger audience. Uh, by the way, I, I love what you're doing. I just think that what you're doing, and, 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 and you have a lot of young people in here. I uh -huh. learned from your producer, and I think that is so f***ing great. <laughs> what the establishment doesn't understand is that life doesn't go away because we get old. It just gets richer. But I fear, I don't know about you, I fear death. I'm, I'm, I don't think we're going anywhere, and so I don't want to leave. I don't, I'm too curious to not be around, to not exist drives me nuts. But maybe I can't do anything the, about it. Maybe in the last few minutes, your curiosity is going to turn into, I can't wait to find out what happens. What do you think happens? What a good question. I am utterly content not knowing. And I think it's great. I think this game of life is so hard. It's hard to be a human being. I think one has to learn to enjoy the hardship. Now, now as I say that, I think about people who, you know, the multitudes who have no way of enjoying it. And yet, you see them smiling in photographs. Something about the human spirit that is so wonderful. At the end of it all, the biggest question in our world, you know, ever in our lives, stands and remains. And uh, I don't want to go close to the answer now. <laughs> <laughs> do you think I, there well, is something or do you hope there is something? I am married to a woman who knows there is something. Me too. I don't know how they know. I don't know how they know either, but I, I love her faith. It's utter faith. She, 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 if she were here, she wouldn't call it faith. She knows. Yeah, my if wife too knows. How could yeah. you know, no? Come on. <laughs> that's, we're rational, that's intelligent what, human beings. How could you know there's someone that's looking out over you? Come on. We go through that all the time. I love that. That's the best discussion going. But you can't argue with faith. Can't argue it. No, uh, but I know <laughs> there are facts. The fact is nobody's come back and told us. Right. So it is faith. It isn't fact. Uh, and I'm content not to know. I'm really content not to know. Are you getting ready for the elections? I've been ready for the elections a long time. <laughs> Do you think Hillary's going to run in two years? I, I have no idea. I mean, I think she's going to run, but it doesn't mean a thing, my thinking. So. Are you disappointed in Obama? I am. You know what I'm disappointed in? I'm disappointed. I, we need a father. Age has nothing to do with the kind of thing I'm talking about. But I, at my age, need a father. I thought he had the capacity to be, my, to be the father this country needs, to tell us what we don't want to hear. And Teddy's your brother, right? And he, who's my brother? He's your, he's your brother. He's not your father. He's the professor at school who's it's, your brother. Y yes, he's my far younger brother. But he had the capacity, I thought, to be the papa the country needs to cause us to look in the mirror and see ourselves correctly. Uh, has Clinton We're not God's chosen. <laughs> you know, America is not God's chosen. Clinton was a great president, in my opinion. He'd I, be elected today. I, here's, here's my favorite Clinton story. Uh, I had asked him to come to New York uh, when he lost the election in Arkansas and talk about becoming the, the chairman of People for the American Way. It was only a year old at the time. And, uh, and he knew my wife was pregnant, and he met her at the time. Anyway, the, the, try to make a long story short, 
it had been many years since I'd seen him and I was at a breakfast in his honor when he was the president. And he said, uh, when he said hello, he said, uh, Ben, how's Ben? He remembered the name. I said, he's wonderful. He said, uh, he's got to be about 10 years, he's going to be 10 years old soon. Couldn't believe that he said that. A great man. And, and, uh, and I said, yes. He said, for his 10th birthday, you got to bring him to the White House. It's his White House. He's got to experience staying there. So uh, my wife, Lynn, and I and Ben spent a night in the, in, in the Lincoln bedroom. Wow. And in the book, you'll, there's a photograph of Ben in the, on, the, on the bed in the Lincoln bedroom. He held my boy when Chance was six months old. Is that right? How, how old the, is he now? He's 15. It was the day the war ended in Bosnia. Uh -huh. We thought we'd cancel the picture. He didn't. Instead, he looked at him and he said, you don't know what's going on, but someday you're going to be in history class. When they mention Bosnia, raise your hand. <laughs> you were there. He wrote the forward I to just, my book. I love that. I just yeah. love He's that. a hell of a man. And you're a hell of a man. Norman Lear plays a game of If You Only Knew, and we'll take some of your questions right after this. We're back with Norman Lear, the book. Even this I get to experience. Some social media questions. Michael Bearden on Instagram. How did you become socially conscious? You did it at a time when there was less tolerance for diversity. Are your thoughts on TV, art, music in general today? But how did you become socially conscious? Do you remember? Or were you always that way? Uh, I, uh, I'm an observer. I mean, I, I, I listen a lot and I see. I don't know how you can grow up not socially conscious. I think you can grow up with too many other things like poverty like ill health on your mind to divert you. But if things are going well enough, how can you not see what's around you and what's impacting everybody? I never understood bigotry. I never understood well people. I would. certainly haven't. Never. John Hausman tweets, what are your favorite shows today? I love uh, Modern Family, I, as we talked about earlier, you know, Seth and, uh, and my South Park friends, Trey and Matt, and, <laughs> and a lot of the drama, a lot of the drama. I'm going to fail to remember the names of, you know. Watch the, Ray Donovan? The, I have not seen That's... Ray, but Ray Donovan is one of a half a dozen shows that friends I respect are always telling me, you got to watch. You gotta Ray watch. Donovan is a great drama. You can't watch everything, can you? No. It's too much. The, uh, visual Arranger asks, what's the best pitch you heard in an elevator? Anyone pitch shows to you? The best, the best pitch. pitch I ever heard. <laughs> I'm reminded of, a, 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 my head goes right away to an all in the family that Carol didn't want to do because it was five people in a stuck elevator. And one of them was pregnant, about to have a baby and the panic in a, in, in, with the elevators that caused her to go into uh, uh, birth. And, and that was the biggest fight we ever had over that elevator story. Why didn't he want elevator to do it? Story. Five people in an elevator you can't do, you know, 26 minutes or whatever it was at the time. And, uh, and, a, and a baby born, I mean, he, and I realized it was a tough, tough thing to ask him to do. But the notion of having a baby, the first sounds of a baby playing on his face. I loved his face better than he did. <laughs> and uh, Did it work? Oh, my God. I don't remember that episode. Wow. Rome 12, 13. What, do you have a bucket list? What's left on your bucket list? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. A little game of if you only knew. Go back. Remember the first girl you ever kissed? I very well. What was her name? Her name was Adrian. How Adrian old? Young. How old were you? I was uh, 16. Oh, late. <laughs> well, I mean really kissed. Oh, I don't oh. I don't mean spin the bottle kissed. No. I mean really kissed. kissed in New York in Connecticut. Best advice you ever received as a writer, write. If you were stuck on a desert island, what three things would you want? Uh, I want a baked potato, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm trying to fight to find a way to have all my kids and call it one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's acceptable. Favorite curse word? Uh, I say f a lot. Yeah, me too. 
Biggest splurge. Biggest splurge? I've splurged a lot. I'm, I think of splurge uh, not just in spending money, but you know, splurging in life. Life and leaning in. Favorite actor you've worked with? Favorite actor? I'll say Carol O'Connor. Favorite childhood memory? I was driving. I was taking one of my early dates with a woman I later married. We were going to, Connecticut, to Westport, Connecticut to see Tyrone Power oh. with a handful of people in your audience that remember Tyrone Power and his wife Annabella in Lillian, one of my favorite plays. And uh, my father was coming home to gave, give me his terraplane, Hudson terraplane, so I didn't have to drive my Model A <laughs> and pick oh. up my wife and so forth. And he didn't get home. And I picked her up crying in Euphoria. my Model A, went all the way through Bridgeport, Waterbury, Middletown, whatever, and onto the Merritt Parkway. I'm within 10 minutes of the, of, of the theater, and I hear honk, honk, honk. And my father has caught up with me. We change cars. Wow. And I drive with, in, in the terraplane, he drives the Model A. Any advice for aspiring TV writers and showrunners? Right. And don't lose your conviction. Three people you'd love to have dinner with? Uh, you, now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mark Twain and uh, Bernard Shaw. Was Mark Twain the best American writer? Well, he... I don't know if he's the best. Uh, my mind goes to Emerson because I love Emerson. Uh, but between them, they cover the, the, the waterfront. If you didn't have a career in entertainment, what do you think you'd have done? I'd have stayed in my Uncle Al's shoe store. <laughs> Selling <laughs> shoes? I, I can't imagine what I'd have done. Huh. Me either. Norm, you're a great man. Thank you. I love being here. Even this I get to experience. My guest, the great Norman Baird. You can find me on Twitter at King's Things. Thanks for joining us.